everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. This is going to be kind of a free-form, unscripted, long-form video today. I'm going to show you a lot of the records that I've got in the last few months. Some in for review at Audiophilia, many just for fun, some off Discogs, and different uh, genres, different styles. Rather than go into all of them, if they're in my collection, they usually sound pretty good to incredibly good. So they're pretty well good buys as far as audiophile sound is concerned. But they also, they're also fantastic musically. They may not be your style, and that's fine, but I can recommend every one of these records. Uh, some of them I found for five, bu five bucks at a record show. Uh, this one here, for example, is on the Triptych label. It's a, it's a, I think it's about a seven-year-old label from Holland, the Netherlands, Utrecht, a great company that does incredibly good productions and uh, use young Dutch artists. And this is Nicholas van Puka. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. This is volume one. This is, I think it's 60 euros. It's a double album. It's 33, not 45, but um, that's one of the best albums I've had in the last little while. This was sent to me by Triptych, so I'm very, very happy. There's the sign. And they've got a great website. Nicholas Van Puka, The Schumann Collection. And on it is Carnival, one of my favorite pieces, Fantasy Stucke, and Arabesque. I'm looking forward to number two already. This was a gift from a friend. I couldn't believe it. Um, stereo disc is a reissue. A lot of these are reissues. Some of the Japanese pressings, I'll tell you which ones are which. This is a scary good recording. If it's um, if it's in your budget, try and get this one. I, the, the first two I've shown you, I think, are fairly expensive. Although this was a gift. As I'm looking at this, I'm looking at the reflections. I'm, I apologize. I'm no Cecil B. DeMille, and I'm filming it on an iPhone, so... Uh, you get what you get, but I'll do my best to keep the, the light from your eyes. My friend Steve Dubinsky, who's a really great trumpet player in Montreal, when I asked him when I was, we were much younger, I said, you know, who do you think, who's your favorite jazz trumpet player? Who's the greatest jazz trumpet player? Without even flinching, he said Louis Armstrong, then explained to me for an hour why he's the greatest. I, I didn't know much about Louis Armstrong. Of course, I'd heard of him, but didn't know he was playing. Um, and then after Steve told me about it, I started listening. And of course, it's incredible. And this is really wonderful. This is a, a local, well, local, I wish, I wish I lived in New York. This is a New York City jazz musician and another fellow that lives in New York, Greg Tui. Jerome Saba, he plays tenor sax. And um, this is a, a self-produced album that I reviewed last year. It's called No Filter. It's totally analog from beginning to end. You can get it at Jerome's uh, website. It's fantastic. It's really a great repertoire, beautifully played. Jerome has a gorgeous sound on the tennis axe. And uh, I even signed it. It was very nice. And there's the, uh, there's the cast of characters, and they're all fantastic. And if you can freeze it, you can see basically how they recorded it. Analog Central. That's a good one. Montreal's Finest. This is Anne Bisson, or as I call her, Madame Bisson. I'm from Montreal. She's from Montreal. Uh, this is a fabulous uh, double album, 45 RPM. It's called Keys to My Heart. Anne is a wonderful lady. If you go to audio shows, invariably she's doing a set or two at audio shows. Uh, audiophiles love her, but she's also a fantastic musician and an actress and a TV presenter in Montreal. Multi-talented human being. Uh, keys to, oh, this is very nice. They actually, uh, she came to visit us uh, in on the island here a little while ago, and we had so much fun. What a delightful lady she is. But she also sings and plays beautifully. She recorded this in L.A. at uh, Hollywood... Uh, forget the name of the studio it's in Hollywood and um, with some local um, LA jazz and session musicians and it's fantastic keys to my heart you can get this from her website it's 45 to 45 RPM 
another friend, Walter Schofield from um, Krell, uh, introduced this Japanese pressing to me at a at a at a show. The last show we went to, oh my God, it's been so long. Um, really missing the shows. We'll get, actually, we're going to just announce something. We're going to be at the Seattle show at the end of July, beginning of August. So hopefully we will see you there. But we'll do, be, definitely be covering it. Uh, man, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've missed audio shows. After four days walking around, it's like, oh my God, I'm cursing it because it's so tiring. But boy, when, as soon as it's over and you get your, the feeling back in your legs, it's like, when's the next one? Anyway, this track he was playing, I forget the name of the song. Let me see if I can find it. It's all in Japanese, of course. Um, it's a fantastic pressing. James Taylor, wonderful, sensitive artist, of course. Everybody knows James Taylor. But I didn't have any of his records, and this was absolutely beautiful. I should say thank you to my friend John Stratton from Pure Fidelity in Vancouver. He's the, um, you can see it at the top right there. That's the Pure Fidelity turntable that I use in my mono setup. And John is, uh, he's an incredibly gifted person, another multi-talented individual. And he brought over some records to test this uh, before while we were setting it up for the review. And he said, oh, no, this is a Japanese pressing. And of course, I'd heard of Japanese pressings. After 25 years writing about records, I should know what a Japanese pressing is. But I didn't, I hadn't heard many of them. And then I heard the one he, and I'll, I'll show you the one he showed me later on. But I became obsessed with Japanese pressings. Really quiet, beautiful vinyl, uh, fantastic sound. And this is very worth getting. This is not a uh, Japanese pressing. I, I'm not sure if this is analog produ productions or what. Um, it's, sorry about the reflection. Let's try and, of course, it's Aja by Steely, Jan, Steely Dan. One of the greatest uh, fusion albums of all time, including all the greatest musicians. Uh, everyone knows, every audiophile knows the story of Steely Dan, and most musicians uh, love their stuff, mainly because they're well, the two geniuses. And uh, they use the best musicians in L.A. and New York. And what they used to do, as many of you know, they would have them into the session, uh, have us uh, lay down a track, and have... 10 guitarists come in and lay down on the track, five sax players, four trumpet players, about a hundred drummers. That's why you see on every track, different drummers, different bass players, and they'd have the best. So listen, you know, they're, they're smart guys. They're really great musicians. And then they surround themselves with the best. And then of course they produce things like Aja. That's a fantastic reissue. Let's see what's inside. Maybe you guys can figure out where the. I think it's. I think it's analog sounds. There's so many. There's Testament and Speaker's Corner and a couple of ones I can't pronounce. I'll show you as we go along. But anyway, that's that's amazing. And then I've got about four or five other Steely Dan um, Japanese pressings. If you go to Discogs, yeah, it's going to be a little bit more money. Uh, boy, Discogs. Those guys know how to deal on Discogs. The the days of the five dollar records are over. It's fantastic. <laughs> Tell me that's not in the 70s. Pretzel Logic. And I'll just go through these quickly. Katie Lied. I mean, there's 88 songs in their, uh, in their catalog. And they're, they're all perfect. I mean, it's like, a little bit like Mozart, right? right? Every single note. It, we take one out of place and it's, it's, it, it diminishes it. Just incredible stuff. The Royal Scam, Steely Dan. And another fantastic one, Countdown to Ecstasy. What are some of the songs on this one? Bodhisattva. I don't know if you know that one, but <laughs> Bodhisattva is an incredibly energetic piece, virtuoso playing, um, and it's really good. The, but if you ever get a chance to hear the live version, it's insane. It's about 20 minutes, and it's just fantastic. Uh, your Gold Teeth, My Old School, King of the World. There he is. There's the man. There he is. A lot of people think of Steely Dan as, you know, musicians. You know, they forget that uh, this man over here who died recently, Walter Becker, rest in peace. When you see them on creating on YouTube, you realize it was a 50-50 partnership. It wasn't all Donald Fagan, although he is pretty incredible. You all know these. 
of course, you know, Jimmy Page, who am I to say about Jimmy Page? Another genius. And uh, he was saying that he, he loved the remasterings that you got the, from the CD and the digital. They repressed on those $35 versions. I, I got one. And I, look, I'm no Led Zeppelin aficionado. I love their stuff. And I've only discovered them recently, if you can actually believe that typical classical musician. But I will tell you, the pressings were awful. The sound was awful. The Japanese pressings are fantastic. They really are. They're, they're not cheap. I think they were about $50, $60 each on, um, on Discogs. But you got you know, you got to have Led Zeppelin. There's Led Zeppelin 3. Same thing, Japanese pressing. Just trying to think about this one song. That's it. The Immigrant Song, side one. <laughs> That'll set your stereo free, I'll tell you. And this one. What I love about Led Zeppelin, their first album, is they had such an incredibly well-defined style. Like, I was listening the other day to Shostakovich's first symphony. He was 17 years old when he wrote that at the St. Petersburg Conservatory. And it's, I was talking to my wife about it. Like, his style is incredibly defined at 17, which is remarkable. And different music, different genre, of course. But Led Zeppelin... Four guys, some of them session guys, and then, you know, got together. I don't know the story. You all, all you guys know the stories far more than I. But their sound is so defined and so brilliant and so cohesive and coherent. Brilliant. If that's not in your, if that's not in your um, repertoire, if you're the, even the snootiest classical musician, you need to treat yourself. One more Steely Dan. This is Gaucho. Many people consider their favorite, their, their, their best album, but um, certainly I think it was, I'm not sure if it was this one or the Nightfly, uh, Donald Fagan's solo album that was the first digital pop album, but this is an incredibly good sounding album, Steely Dan. Now this is the record I was talking, sorry about the glimpse, this is the record I was talking about that my friend John Stratton uh, suggested to me, Mary Coughlin, she's an Irish singer, this is about, I think it's from the 70s, I think. Just looking here, I can't see it <clears throat> offhand. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's an old album. There she is, Mary. This is a delightful album, beautifully recorded. The sound is absolutely gorgeous, and she's fantastic. I don't know what's going on with her if she's still singing, uh, but this is wonderful. It's called. I'm sure many of you have this. Tired and emotional. Highly recommended. Thanks, John. Now this one is, uh, it's not, it's a living stereo and it's not a analog productions. It's The Death and the Maiden by Schubert, which is a fantastic string quartet. It's a pretty standard recording in the Juilliard string quartet. An amazing group. Now, this is a reissue by a company called Analog, oh, I, I can't remember the name. I'm going to press pause for a second to get it. Got it. Thanks to my wife who's assisting me today. Analog phonic. I don't know why I have such a difficult time with that word. Two simple words, analog phonic. Living stereo, and it is a German pressing. I sent an email to these guys, landed on deaf ears, so maybe... They don't care, or they didn't get it, or they're thinking, who the hell is this guy? But anyway, uh, they're worth exploring. This is a very good good uh, pressing. It's a little, a little, a little, not tizzy, a little, little hot, but then so is the piece, and so is the Julia String Quartet, and so is the original recording, so what the hell. It's, but it's worth getting. This is one of my favorite sh trumpet players, Kenny Doran. Uh, this is a stereo blue note. Um, I got this off um, off Discogs. It wasn't cheap, but Kenny Durham. I like Kenny Durham's mono recordings. Like I used to have um, Kenny Quiet Kenny, the mono version, which was exceptional. If you get if you can get that record, it's really good. But this is Whistle Stop. Look at the people playing. You know, again, like I was saying about Steely Dan and and. Uh, Led Zeppelin, surround yourself with brilliant people. It's always the best way. My, uh, the, the guy, our team at Audio Freely, they make me look good every day. I'm so lucky. 
So yeah, they've got Hank Mobley, Kenny Drew, Paul Chambers, and on drums, of course, Philly Joe Jones. That's a great one. This is one I would not have thought about getting. I mean, I'd heard of Sam Cooke, Mr. Soul, but again, my friend John uh, said, brought it over to test out his, his Pure Fidelity turntable in my system before I reviewed it and played me this. It was just remarkably good. Beautiful singing, great, great songs, and uh, a really good um, reissue. Again, I'm not sure where this is. If you go to Discogs, they'll probably have the reissue. But it's very, very good. The sound is fantastic. Now, this is an interesting one. This is, I got this recently. I'm not sure the year of the recording. Para concert in St. Janskerk de Gouda. Now, that's got to be a Dutch church, a church in the Netherlands. And it is. Near Gouda, where the cheese comes from. And it's Frank van Koten Oboe. He's a hobo who plays the oboe. <laughs> I sound like I'm doing jokes like Michael Fremer. Uh, Vim Dandapana on Orgel, which is obviously organ. And this is a very interesting record. It's, you know, I'm not sure if the originals for oboe and, oh, um, no, it wouldn't be originals for oboe and an organ with a prelude and fugue by Bach. Maybe the Handel Sonata and uh, Krebs, I don't know. But I will tell you, the performance, Frank Van Kooten is one hell of an oboe player, and the performance is great, but the recording is absolutely to die for. So if you get a chance to get that record, you might get it in a, in a, in a sale. I'm sure you can get it on Discogs. It's, um, let's slow it up there. Production of Harlem, H-A-A-R-L-E-M, of course, in the Netherlands. So yeah, it's, it's worth it. It's worth finding that. The music is beautiful, the performances are great, but the sound, oh my God. Now this one, I just bought these two out because I wanted to talk just briefly about reissues compared to originals. Now my friend Richard, passed away since in, in Toronto, was a fine writer for um, various magazines. And before we became friends, uh, he had myself and another friend over to listen one time. And he was the type of guy that had uh, about 5,000 records. He had three of everything. A sealed original. He had a, uh, a playing original. And then he had a backup, just in case something happened. He's one of those guys. Talk about an audio file that's uh, OCD. He was a great guy, though. But before we became good friends... He decided to have me over, like I mentioned, and we listened. And I mentioned, and all I said was, you know, sometimes I prefer the reissues. Well, that was like red rag to a bull. <laughs> Richard was not happy. How can you say that, Anthony? My God, I thought you were a professional musician. Don't you have ears? And he got a little heated, but not too bad. But there was a second act to this <laughs> passion on file. He called me about a month later, and then another hour on the phone. I wouldn't have spent that much time, but he was such a nice guy. I thought he had a lot of potential as a human being. So I, I spent a, a, a good hour on the phone and tried to convince him. And But in this one, he's right on. This is a Analog Productions recording, which are 99 times out of 100, they're just incredible. And the one out of the 100 is still very good. And this is the one. It's very, very good. Nothing wrong with it. But the original, Strauss Waltz's Ryan of Chicago Symphony. And this is a Montreal pressing. This is not even the uh, a Camden pressing. And it is fantastic. And it really, it knocks the spots off. Sorry, Analog Productions. That's the one time when I'm going with my buddy Richard. This I know is Speaker's Corner, because I have the other Schubert one they did, the uh, Trout Quintet. This is the Vienna Octet. Sorry about that. Let's see. There we go. Schubert Octet, one of the greatest chamber music pieces in the repertoire. This is a Decker, and it's it does sound wonderful. Just to let you know, the, the Vienna Octet is very interesting. It's got Willy Boskowski on first file, and he was one of the greatest, probably the most famous leader of that orchestra ever. Uh, his, I think it's his cousin, Alfred Boskowski on clarinet. Just, 
I know there's some clarinet players that watch my channel and read Audiophilia and some friends of mine. It's a unique sound, and it's not even like a German system sound like a lot of people. It's just unique, so just beware if you get this record. But it's, it's very authentic, if you know what I mean. Fantastic recording, too. I think it was recorded in the Sofian Saal, which is the most famous recording venue in, in Vienna. This is a very interesting record. One of my favorite conductors, Sir Thomas Beecham, conducting repertoire that you wouldn't have thought would be down his alley. I mean, he's a great musician, can conduct anything. But this is a fantastic interpretation. And uh, the Royal Philharmonic, which was his orchestra, he founded it. When the London Philharmonic decided to go kind of self-governing, he said that he just went, I'm going to be, I want to, I want to run everything. So, of course, he had Beecham's Pills, which is now GlaxoSmithKline, the uh, pharmaceutical company. And uh, he decided, well, I'll just form my own orchestra, the Royal Philharmonic, which is the last 30 years gone through hard times, ups and downs. One of my good friends is the concert master of that orchestra now, and it's 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 really coming on, coming along. They're they're, uh, they're surviving even through this horrible COVID. This is a, a supercuts, high key record supercuts. It's a fantastic recording, and the violin soloist, as you can see, is one of Toronto's favorite sons, Stephen Starrick, who got the job with Beecham. If you can imagine this, fresh out of Canada when he was 19. And uh, his first, I think his first recording <laughs> is one of the greatest recordings of it in the, in, in, on records, is Scheherazade. And his playing on that is fantastic. It's also fantastic on this. But this is really good, very powerful. And, uh, you know, Beecham was fantastic for the lollipops, you know, the, um, and, and Frederick Delius, who he championed. And you think, wow, Heldenleben? A hero's life. Guess who the hero was? Richard Strauss. This one I got recently, it's um, it's a uh, Analog Productions, Overture, Overture. I think somebody said, wow, that's pretty crappy. I'm going to, um, I'm going to just trade it in. So I think I got it for like 10 bucks. As the new Symphony Orchestra of London, which is basically the LSO, Raymond Agu, no idea. I think he was a, probably a ballet conductor. It's got an interesting thing, interesting repertoire. Zamper, If I Were King, these are all... You know, Von Suppe was a was a bandmaster in the Prussian, I think, army, and he wrote some fantastic pieces. Uh, Light Cavalry. If you don't know that piece, I'm not going to sing it because trust me, you don't want me to sing, <laughs> and I don't have my flute handy. So imagine I'm conducting it to you. Uh, Light Cavalry. It's a very very good piece, very dramatic, and it sounds it sounds very good. Light Cavalry. If you get this, you can get it for ten bucks. Fine, buy, buy it. It's very well recorded and very well played. You can, get, you can, get, you can imagine the LSO showed up at uh, five minutes before the gig. The downbeat came down, the red light went on, and they, they got it in one session. This one is a special record. This is the band of the 1318th Royal Hussars, Queen Mary's Own. And the reason I, I got this record on Discogs, which I didn't tell my wife exactly how much it cost me, but it was, it was a lot. Uh, there's not many around. This is uh, from... Music masters that, that record British bands, uh, mainly the Guards bands, the, the Scotch Guards, Scots Guards, the Irish Guards, Welsh Guards, etc. Uh, Grenadier Guards, of course, and the, the best band, I think, is the Coldstream Guards, a very fine band. But this was my father's band. My father was the music director of this band from 63, I think, to 69. And um, this, this was recorded about five years after he left, and some of the same musicians that actually used to babysit me <laughs> and my, my twin brother uh, when we lived in, um, lived in Germany, uh, which is where the, the regiment was stationed. But this has a, 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 um, a lot of uh, sentimental value, but it's actually very well played. And if you get a chance to get some of these records, especially the guards bands, the, the playing is it's amazing. The, the commanding officer, have a look at his name. Lieutenant Colonel R.J.W. French Blake. French, lowercase with two Fs. <laughs> Only in England. <laughs> Do you guys know Michael Fremer? Yeah, well, everyone knows Michael. Michael's a fantastic guy and uh, has a great channel called Analog Planet. And if you go there, he's got uh, some of the records that you really should own. And he, he recommended this one and 
I'm more an admirer of Ellington, not a fan. But boy, he was right. I mean, this is a 1950 mono. And I get to play it on my mono setup with my Icon, Aud Icon Audio PS1 Mark III dedicated to the mono. And I've got the Miyajima uh, cartridge, which if you follow what you feel, you read it, you've it just got a rave review. It's fantastic. But this is an incredibly good recording. <laughs> Michael was bang on. Uh, Mood Indigo. I don't know. It's crazy. It's so good. And it's mono. And... And I played on a with a mono conical 1.0 cartridge, and um, and with a mono switch. And it's some people say it doesn't really matter because you can actually play this on a stereo rec on a stereo setup because it's it's a reissue and you, and and the, the groove you can do a 0.7 stereo into there is no problem. And some people think the mono switch is enough, but boy, playing it on the, with a mono switch and a mono cartridge, it's pretty spectacular. Masterpieces is right. We're coming to the end. Thanks for sticking with me. This is a fantastic album. Homemade Ice Cream by Tony Joe White. This is the 45 uh, reissue. I think it's analog. I'm not sure this Tony in the 70s. I think he died only recently. And it's just... Yeah, analog productions. There you go. And it's just a fantastic record. If you don't have this, I mean, it's it's one of my benchmarks up there with the Janice and uh, Janice and uh, uh, Fit Forty Five. It's just incredible. That's 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 a must for your collection. And the music's so so good. Swamp Rock, Swamp Rock. <laughs> I think that's what they call it. Homemade ice cream. My wife specifically loves this album. It's fantastic. But I think she likes the hairy chest. Anyway, that's another story. She's sitting here, going to hit me in a second. And these are from my friend Abby Fawn at Impex Records. Impex is another uh, company other than Analog Productions and Analog Phonic and other ones that, you know, do these incredible reissues. And they take their time in this massive from the analog tapes with great uh, mastering engineers and, of course, pressed beautifully on great quality vinyl. The artwork and, and the, the covers are just first class. This is Monk's Dream, the Monk Quart Thelonious Monk Quartet. Everyone has this, it's pretty standard. Just absolutely brilliant uh, reissue by Impex. I-M-P-E-X, highly recommended. I think they have about 20 or 30 albums, or maybe a little more, 40 albums in their catalog. Some of them are sold out, of course, and I keep begging Abby, if she'll send me the uh, Heifetz one. So, Abby, if you're listening, <laughs> can I have that Heifetz one, please? I'd love to review it. There it is. And finally, I've saved probably my favorite album this year so far. This is another Impex re uh, reissue. It's from Frank from 1950. Sing and Dance with Frank Sinatra. Literally... When I first heard this, it's literally staggering. Uh, Columbia Mono. Again, I get to play it on my mono setup, but you can play it on a stereo setup, no problem. If you've got a mono switch, though, throw that. I think you might be surprised. But this is spectacular. And some of the songs, you can see... Uh, first of all, look at the production. I mean, it's just... There's, a, there, there's, a, there's booklets, and uh, on the second side is there's bonus tracks, alternate takes, and the sessions... And to hear Frank talking to the producers, it's really wonderful. I mean, they're, they're historical documents, but it's this one. Lover by Rogers and Hart. You know, Rogers and Hammerstein wrote some incredible songs. But when you think about Rogers and Hart, his earlier collaborator, and some of the songs they wrote, they're just amazing. And this Lover is, is I mean, other than My Funny Valentine, which is their most famous song, Lover... It's an incredible song, and uh, when you put it on, you hear Frank singing beautiful, as they says, rich in musical te texture, it's gorgeous, and he builds the song and builds a song until he hits a high note at the end that literally when I first heard it, I nearly jumped out of my seat. It's absolutely incredible, and I think I wrote in one of my Instagram posts that it's as thrilling as anything you'll hear at the Met or at the Bayreuth Festival with incredible tenors. It's Although he's a baritone, <laughs> but it's this note that's incredible. So if you get a chance to get any of these records, if you get them, 
second hand or at a garage sale, which is nearly impossible these days, that would be something. But there are quite a few there that you could invest in and I think you would be very, very happy. This is a 33, by the way, um, and uh, very highly recommended. Listen, thanks for listening. This was Unscrapped, scripted, long form. Uh, audio is a massive part of my day. Even during this COVID stuff, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm really enjoying doing the, the, uh, the videos a lot more than I should. I've got a new editing program, Final Cut Pro, and I've kind of like taking a million videos and, and doing the best I can to edit them. I need better equipment. I've upped the mic a little bit. I've got a Shure MV88, that helps. Um, again, I never forget how lucky I am to be in the position I am at Audiophilia where I get to review some of the greatest equipment and some of the greatest music. Um, reviewing and listening, I will tell you, is a lot easier than conducting and playing the flute. <laughs> a lot easier. So these days, as I'm getting older and uh, during COVID, I'm really loving the time I have to put into it. I've got, we've got the best team at Audiophilia, and uh, I've got the best wife. So thanks, Jan, for helping me out. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay safe, and we'll see you in the next video.